Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Bharat Ganesh. Um, I'm an assistant professor of media studies at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, and I'll be leading this session along with Evian Leidig, uh, who I'm going to let uh, Evian introduce herself now. Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Evian Leidig, and I am a postdoctoral affiliate at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo in Norway. I'm very much looking forward to this session. Okay, well, thanks a lot, everyone, for, for being here. Um, we're going to get started. I'm going to go through our agenda, and then we're going to break out and assign people into breakout groups. Um, so one of the goals we have here is to make this uh, kind of a, an interactive session. Um, and we want to give all of you a chance to kind of reflect on what you think about the terms radicalization um, and behavioral change. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce the session a little bit um, and uh, we'll get broken up into, into our breakout groups. So we have seven things we'd like to do today. Uh, the first one is we're going to have a little introduction where um, uh, Evian and myself will kind of just give you a little bit of an overview about our research. Um, and then we'll have a warm up where we get a chance to get to know one another. I'm sure that all of you have had a, maybe a chance to get to know a few people, but uh, we'd like to uh, uh, just get a sense of who's in the room, what kinds of things you're interested in. Um, as well, uh, we'll have our first breakout session to kind of get started after the warm up, where we think a little bit about what radicalization is. And then what we'll do is we'll have a kind of uh, a session where Avian and I will talk about what radicalization means in theory and practice um, before going into a second breakout group well, where we'll have a chance to kind of discuss the previous projects that you might have worked on. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll have a longer discussion about uh, what is behavioral change, uh, what, is, uh, what are the different ways we can measure behavior change, uh, and how can we apply that in different projects. And then finally, uh, we'll have a little bit of a discussion session to, to sum up and kind of uh, organize and consolidate the key takeaways from our session. I just want to let you know as we're going, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. And um, uh, I or everyone will get to it as soon as we can. Um, but uh, for now, uh, I think we'll start by just kind of doing some quick introductions to both of us. So just to give you an overview of my research, um, I kind of focus on three, three areas. Um, the first one is on digital hate culture. Um, and I'm kind of interested in uh, the way in which we talk about the kind of groups of users that are distributed all, across all these different kinds of platforms that spread uh, uh, hateful messages, that engage in hate speech. And primarily my role is, uh, or my focus I should say, is, is more about looking into uh, different kinds of racism uh, and how racism plays a role in, uh, in digital hate culture. Uh, so one of the things I'm working on is how do we think about sort of how these uh, social movements work and how we can characterize them. One of the things I've been thinking about are how to deal with what we might call swarms of users that are coordinated across different social media platforms. Um, I'm interested in uh, the, how the far right operates on mainstream platforms, and I've written a little bit about imaginaries right, like the red pill uh, and, and white genocide. That's sort of what I've done in the last few years, but my current projects are kind of taking a new, new direction now. Um, so one of the things I'm working on a lot more is political communication, which is what politicians say um, and the role that uh, politicians play in enabling far right extremism. Um, as well as the way in which platforms also play a role in enabling far-right extremism, right? So that's thinking about how their algorithms continue to provide recommendations for, uh, for white supremacist content, uh, looking at the different ways in which platform policies operate, which kind of gets me into the third point of my research agenda at the moment, which is looking at how do social media platforms actually try to govern extremism? And what we'll talk a little bit about today are forms of strategic communication like counter narratives or counter messaging and content moderation like taking down users or suspending networks of users um, as kind of governance strategies for trying to address uh, extremism on social media platforms. Just to give you an idea about some of my um, uh, recent papers and resources, uh, this presentation, by the way, will be shared with you later. Uh, but these are just three things I've written recently that might be of interest, especially the second one, which is a report that I wrote with Voxpol uh, uh, and came out at the start of this year that kind of covers this idea about what extreme digital speech is um, and different ways uh, different actors are trying to combat extreme speech online. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about these issues in the future, uh, a, a little bit later today, I should say. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Evian to, to share a little bit about her research. Great, thank you very much. So um, my uh, research at the moment focuses on what are far-right influencers on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. And I do look at these mainstream social media platforms, but part of my work also looks at some of uh, other platforms like TikTok, for instance. So there are some crossover in, in the types of platforms that I look at in terms of influencers. Um, and the questions I guide my research are, how do these influencers build audiences and recruit followers into far-right networks? Uh, what is the messaging of these influencers? What's the content that they're trying to promote? Um, and then also, how do they relate to other influencers within these far-right spaces online? And in particular, I look at the role of women and gender in far-right movements. So I look at how issues like femininity and masculinity, both of which are very important in understanding gender in the far-right, how femininity and masculinity are used to recruit and to retain followers uh, into these far-right spaces. And at the moment, I'm very interested in understanding why do traditional gender roles appear to younger people, and in particular, to millennials and to Gen Z followers who might be attracted to this type of content. Uh, next slide, please. It's loading, great. And just uh, for a basis of my current research and papers, um, a lot of today's discussion will focus on insights I have gained for a forthcoming book that I have called Trad Wife, Trad Life women of the alt-right and trad wife refers to uh, what is known as the tr trad wives community online so uh, it's short for traditional wife and similarly trad life refers to traditional life and i'm looking at the overlap between um, the trad wives community online and women in the alt-right and how women in the alt-right use uh, trad wife narratives in order to recruit people into the far right and then in terms of just some references um the first uh, reference you see there is an op-ed uh, I wrote um, looking at the spectrum of gender and online extremism, and I focus on incels and trad wives. And then the second, or really the third reference that you see listed um, is just a compendium that I've co-authored with my colleague at the Center for Research on Extremism. And it's a compendium of entries looking at uh, uh, giving definitions to what is the far right. So we look at what is the far right, um, what is extremism, what is populism, and I think importantly for today's session, what is radicalization as well? So that's a compendium that's written for non-academic audiences that gives a brief overview in terms of definitions and terms. Okay, so today what, uh, uh, what we wanna do to get started is also to get a little bit acquainted with all of you. Um, so what I'd like to do, it's great that we only, have, uh, uh, we only have 18 people in the room right now. So I think that gives us a chance to kind of interact with one another. Um, so if we could just have maybe uh, just to start with uh, each person kind of take a minute to, uh, or maybe a little less than a minute, to just kind of quickly tell us your name, uh, what organization you're with, and what your role is within it, and maybe um, either answer one of these questions. What would you uh, uh, hope to learn from our session, or why it is that you chose this session? But let's try to keep the answers really short so that everybody has, uh, has a chance. Benedict, here he is. Yes. Hello. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we do. Yes, great. Um, my name is Benedict. I'm um, a co-founder of a startup in Berlin that focuses on um, trying to take the lessons learned from international peace building to Europe to see how we can counter polarization and radicalization in our societies. Um, and I chose this session because my background is uh, in psychology. I uh, did a master's in political psychology at Queens in Belfast. And um, yeah, I'm really interested in behavior change, especially how we can use technology in order to, um, to achieve that. Now we have uh, Raluca. I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, yeah, hide you. Hey, hello. Uh, I am Raluca. I'm from Romania. I'm from a federation of authority NGOs, youth NGOs, uh, and I'm vice president in the in my organization. And I'm interested um, in this session because we are now designing the local youth strategy for our city. And we, I want to know how I can, what input I can take from here uh, in order to tackle the subject uh, at the local and regional level.
some ethnicities um, in our region and um, I also have a psychology and political science background and I'm interested in how to take things further and get more into the subject. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, I'm Amina, also a psychologist uh, and gestalt psychotherapist. Uh, recently, for previous few years, I started uh, game design. I use psychological concept in a serious gaming. And I'm also founder of Science Fiction Club in Sarajevo. I'm from Bosnia and I work at the Digital Culture Center. I'm interested uh, because it's behavior and change, and I always want to hear um, other experience and other perspectives on this topic. Thank you. Hi to everyone. Hello. Hello. Uh, sorry, I'm outside, so <laughs> I have to keep the, the mask. Uh, I'm Francesco. Uh, I'm from uh, Joseph Torino uh, in uh, Italy, uh, and uh, I'm, I choose this, uh, this session because it's a topic that uh, we deal with uh, in our organization and also, also in another organization that I, that I work in. And, uh, and I would like to know more from people who actually study and follow these kind of topics uh, every day because maybe some, sometimes we, we deal with this, but I would like to know more from people that know more than me. Great, great. Thanks, Francesco. Thank uh, you. Suna. Hello, uh, my name is Suna Makhlouf. I work, uh, I'm as, I work as a volunteer coach at uh, Palestinian Sports for Life. So what we basically do is um, we um, create awareness for girls um, in the UNI uh, UNICEF schools. Um, and I decided I chose this session because it will help me get a little bit more information about radicalization and behavior change in order to keep the girls aware of these things, the things that are happening online. And stuff like that. Thank you. Taya, to the discussion. Yeah. Hi, my name is Taya. I'm from Slovenia and I work as a student in uh, the organization Kings of the Street. And I work in a community space with the youth, with the neighborhood, and I would want to learn more about radicalization and behavior change so I can include this in my work. Thanks a lot, Taya. Zoran, you're here yes, already. Hello. Uh, so I'm from CPI Foundation in Sarajevo. I work together with Emina, who already presented herself. So we launched this digital youth hub last year and we are trying to build community. We are already making some uh, social games and we want to do more. I have, a, I have four kids and Bosnia and Herzegovina is flooded with different sorts of extremism, political, religious, football, uh, anti-LGBT. So it's something like this is really needed in our society. Uh, my name is Adora. I come from Serbia. I'm a member of Open Communication, which is a debating network which exists in Serbia. I used to be a part of the uh, board member, uh, but right now I'm working as the debating coordinator. We work with kids in high school and universities to teach them debating. And so far we've been successful in sort of when they come with really like extreme attitudes towards something or if they're like extremely nationalistic or homophobic we have managed to sort of sway them more to, uh, to become more tolerant. And I am interested in this topic because I think like understanding how radicalization actually happens is the key to solving it. So that's why I decided to be a part of this session. So thank you. Thank you, Teodora. So for whoever joined uh, now, we are just making a round of introduction. So feel free uh, to join, to ask to share your audio and video and say uh, who you are and why you think this session can be relevant for you. We probably don't have any other people who wants to share. So Baraf is your call. If uh, Evian and Baraf, if you want to say, if you want to wait one minute for other people to 
say something or we can just uh, proceed. Okay, well, um, in the meantime, uh, uh, what we're going to do is assign all of you into, um, into the breakout groups, uh, which is what we're going to start with. Um, but I wonder uh, maybe if we uh, um, maybe improvise a little bit here and uh, we move on to maybe talking a little bit about radicalization uh, before we get into the, uh, uh, into the first breakout group. Um, uh, and then that way it'll give everyone a little bit of time and it'll also give Francesco some time to uh, set up the breakout groups uh, so, that, uh, so that we'll be ready. So we're just going to tweak the schedule a little bit, um, but it'll be clear how that works. Um, so, so once Francesco has a chance to set up the breakout groups, we'll get that started. Um, so I think it's good if we maybe start out with thinking a little bit about the theory and practice of radicalization and, uh, and what radicalization uh, really is. I think it's um, important, and I think um, as we go forward, you know, it's uh, it's important to remember that it's really not easy to define what radicalization is uh, and how we might consider whether someone is or isn't radicalized. And so, as we're going through, Evian and I will bring up some examples uh, to sort of show you how different kinds of uh, radicalization processes work with the far right. Um, but I think it's also important that we start out with thinking about what are some different problematic conceptions about radicalization. Now, I think um, one of the issues is that there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of ideas that are associated with radicalization, particularly the idea that radicalization is causally linked to violence. So what that means is that if you become radicalized, then you're sort of on a conveyor belt that eventually will end up in you committing violence. And that's kind of a theory that's been developed in kind of the post 9-11 world. Um, but there's actually not really a lot of evidence that supports that. So we can't really say that someone becoming more exposed to radical ideas will eventually lead them to becoming uh, uh, engaged in violence. So, so that's one of the kind of concepts we need to think about, that there's sort of a nonlinear process by which someone goes from becoming engaged with radical materials and extremist content to then engaging with violence. It's not, a, it's not always going to result in that, uh, in that kind of process, but it is important that we kind of address and attack the kinds of uh, extremist ideologies. Another point, especially when it comes to far-right radicalization, um, is the idea of this, uh, that, that far-right uh, extremists or far-right terrorists are sort of lone wolves, that they get radicalized online and then go and act out uh, uh, on their own. It's really important that when we, when we think about these sorts of instances of lone wolf attacks, that we actually remember that they're connected to a much broader kind of ecosystem online. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later, looking at some language um, about uh, Britain First on Facebook, which is a far-right party that was really active on Facebook. But it's important to remember that often this idea of a lone wolf is actually something of a myth, right? That these people are actually quite connected through different kinds of social groups. Now, I think the third point also is really important that we keep in mind that the term radicalization and the concept radicalization comes from a policy background that really focuses on Muslims as a security threat. So we have to understand that the concept of radicalization comes from this post 9-11 context. And it really wasn't until the last few years that people started to take seriously the idea that groups other than Muslims could be uh, considered radicalized. So in that sense, there's a, there's a longer history to this term that was really focused on one community. And now we're trying to take this term and then apply it to another one. Um, so, so one of the things we need to keep in mind here is that there's a lot of problems in the term radicalization itself and the policy world that it's connected to. But that doesn't mean we can't try to define radicalization. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some principles that we can use. So I want to put out five principles that I think are really important about radicalization. The first one is that radicalization is not an individual process, but it actually results from an interaction between individuals, the media and information that they consume and, and, and encounter, and their broader social circles. So in this sense, it's really about a broader ecosystem. And especially with a lot of the, the research on the far right, we're finding that radicalization uh, and digital networks really play a key role. 
So in this sense, radicalization is augmented by digital networks and propaganda and interpersonal communication play a really important role in radicalization. Another point I think that's important to remember is that radicalization or even engagement in political violence or terrorism is not actually that closely related to class or education or specific kinds of uh, 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 social positions or social standing. Right? So a lot of times people think about how um, certain kinds of radicalization might re be related to people uh, who come from a particular social class. But usually what we find is that people who are vulnerable to radicalization come from a broad spectrum uh, of positions in society. What I think is really important and what I think uh, a lot of the research tends to show is that actually it's emotional identification with an in-group under threat, like a group that, that one belongs to. Um, uh, so, so the idea that you belong to a group that's under threat and the idea that you need some kind of hostile action towards a group that is threatening us. That's really where I think radicalization kind of uh, uh, is centered. And I'm building here a little bit on J.M. Berger's idea about what is the definition of extremism. The fourth point is that extremist subcultures, so those extremist subcultures can exist on kind of obscure places like 4chan and 8chan and these kinds of places, uh, but also as well as internet forums but also on mainstream platforms or also now messaging applications like Telegram and Discord. So we're seeing that there's a lot of different kinds of extremist subcultures, but what's important is that those subcultures kind of create a sense of belonging and community for individuals. And then finally, gender plays a really important role in radicalization. And Evian's gonna tell you a little bit more about that, uh, especially with, with her work around, uh, 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 around the, the trad wives that she's been studying. But we also see that gender plays an important role in kind of what kinds of ideologies are also being articulated. So these are five pieces, I think, that kind of help us get a better sense of what radicalization is, helps us connect with the kind of dominant threats that, that we see in terms of radicalization um, in, in Europe and, and North America and other places. Um, and that's just to get a, a bit more of a, 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 an idea about how do we actually go about thinking about and defining uh, what radicalization is. Now I want to talk through um, a couple of projects that uh, that I've done in the past, um, and then I'll move over to Evian talking a little bit, and uh, it'll it'll give us a sense of sort of what I hope will will help us understand how radicalization kind of works in the context of social media and social media platforms. So. If you can all see the screen, I hope, um, you can see on the left that there's this kind of uh, network graphic. And what that is, is actually the connection between different words in Facebook comments um, from, the, from, the, from the Facebook page for Britain First. Now, Britain First is a, uh, was a extreme right uh, and white nationalist uh, organization and political party in, in the UK. Um, and in August 2014, they gained a lot of followers in a very short time by, uh, by speaking about uh, an ongoing controversy in the United Kingdom, uh, which was this kind of discussion about uh, 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 child grooming gangs in a city in northern England. And the idea behind child grooming gangs is that there were groups of primarily Asian men um, who were engaging in kind of uh, sexual abuse of, uh, of young women in that area. Now, what we started to see when I was doing some of this research was that in these comments, um, the word Muslim was being related to kind of extreme ideas, right? So Muslims were being referred to as scum. You can see that sort of uh, a little bit below the term Muslim. Um, uh, many uh, Muslims were kind of be being seen as a threat to the country. So we started seeing a lot of action words like send them back, but also more violent ones like bomb them. Um, and what we started to see was kind of the development of these really anti-Muslim and Islamophobic uh, kind of ideologies. Now we took this graph and we took the analysis that we did alongside it to Facebook in 2014. And at the time I was working for an organization called Tell Mama, uh, which, uh, which is an organization in the UK that monitors anti-Muslim hate crimes. Excuse me. 
And so we took this, uh, we took our analysis of all of this uh, and the different frames that were being used to, to these Islamophobic frames that were being used to attack Muslims online to Facebook and said, look, there's a really serious problem here. Um, and what we saw was actually that by 2014, Facebook was kind of reticent to actually take action on this issue. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so moving forward, what we saw is actually by, um, by about 2018, we found that Facebook decided finally to ban Britain first. But in the meantime, Facebook had actually decided that for Tommy Robinson, who is another uh, extreme right activist in the UK, and Britain first, when reports were being made about extremist content on their, uh, on their pages, Facebook was actually forwarding that information onto a special team and actually decided not to take down a lot of that content. So for a long time, actually, Britain First was getting special treatment in terms of, uh, in terms of hate speech. And they were actually able to put, put out and produce a lot of hate speech. And when it was getting reported by users for being offensive or anti-Muslim or Islamophobic, um, a lot of times, actually, Facebook was put it under what they termed special review um, and actually didn't take action on Britain First content. So what we see is that actually over the course of about 2014 to 2018, when Britain First had amassed over a million followers, Facebook was aware of what was going on and was not taking actually very serious action against them. It was finally by 2018, once um, one of the, the or once both of the key figures behind Britain First, who you can see in some of the photos, uh, Jada France and, and Paul Golding, uh, were actually arrested, did Facebook actually start to take action? So that was by May 2018. But actually by 2019, Paul Golding was actually able to purchase an ad on Facebook and once again start spreading these narratives. So what I want to show you with this slide is really to stress the idea that there's these ecosystems that form online and they're really good at exploiting platforms. And when it comes to it, platforms have not really had consistent responses to extremist content. So what we start to see is that there's a mix of people abusing the platforms and trying to exploit them to spread extremist ideas, and also the platforms themselves not coming up with effective policies to counter them. So I know today we've seen a lot of improvement from Facebook and other companies, but in a way, uh, I think we can say that a lot of the damage has already been done. One of the key kinds of uh, discussions and sorts of uh, ways in which this kind of community comes together as we've seen uh, in a little bit more recently. So this is data that I collected uh, from 2017 to 2018 about the alt-right. Um, and one of the ways, one of the things I was doing here was trying to get a sense of how do the alt-right connect with what's going on with the UK? So the alt-right in the US, how do they connect with what's going on in the UK? And the alt-right in the UK, how do they connect with what's going on in the US? Um, and what we started to see was uh, this kind of idea that uh, of what you might call white backlash or this kind of use of white identity and this idea that white identity is being, uh, being put under attack, um, being one of these kind of, uh, kind, of, uh, a kind of common language that was being used across these different users in the alt-right. Um, so these are just some examples. So, so I'm sure many of you have come across the phrase, it's okay to be white, which is kind of a dog whistle that suggests that uh, being white is actually uh, uh, an identity that's being under attack in the US and the UK. And here, this was actually a piece of political advertising uh, from a white supremacist who was running to be um, uh, a congressman in the United States with the Republican Party. In another instance, we see Mark Collette, who's a, who's a former British National Party activist, um, and then now is kind of an alt-right activist on his own, uh, posting a picture of a woman uh, who was killed in a, in a terrorist attack in London. And he says, this is Sarah. She was killed by Muslim terrorists because politicians care more about diversity and immigration than they do about our safety. So again, this is a, another one of those ways in which the idea that, uh, that white identity is coming under attack because, um, and, and then obviously the implication is that immigrants, all immigrants uh, are the ones who are, uh, who, who are responsible for the death uh, of this young woman. And then similarly, uh, to look at something that Donald Trump said back in 2017, he said, people are proud to be saying Merry Christmas again. 
Um, I am proud to have led the charge against the assault of our cherished and beautiful phrase, Merry Christmas. And so here he's kind of using a dog whistle to suggest that people have been attacking the idea that we can even celebrate Christmas, which is obviously false. Um, but here it's really about kind of this idea about generating the idea that, um, that in the US and the UK, people who identify as white are actually an in-group that's being threatened and that diversity, immigration, and the politicians that support that are actually a threat, right? And this is one of the key aspects that we see in right-wing terrorism uh, and far-right extremism today. So I wanted to give you an idea about kind of how different kinds of content can come together in order to, uh, to drive some of these, uh, uh, these kind of extremist ideas and also within these subcultures to kind of create a sense of belonging. So now I'm gonna hand over to Evian to talk a little bit more about how these kinds of trends work out in her research. Great, thank you very much. So as I mentioned earlier, um, my research looks at the role of female far-right influencers on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, so this slide here uh, is an example of what, ma what many women in the so-called alt-right describe as their red pill journeys. And it's quite common for these female alt-right influencers to launch on their YouTube channels um, a personal story about how they became red pilled. Now, red pilled, for those who are not familiar with the term, derives from um, the 1999 film, The Matrix, in which the protagonist, Neo, is offered the red pill, in which he will be awakened to the true realities of the social world, or he can choose to take the blue pill, which means that he can continue to remain ignorant of his surroundings and not be awakened to, quote, the truth. So the alt-right uses this term red pill, and in many ways it signifies what's the beginning of the radicalization process for many in the alt-right. So what I've come across in my research is how these women in the alt-right, these influencers, use their YouTube channels in order to tell their own red pill journeys. Um, oftentimes it's, it's around discussions revolving around a sort of anti-liberalist or at least for women anti-feminist shift um, and how many of these women start off their sort of red pill journeys by listening to many male YouTubers. Um, so there on the top you see, um, that's a YouTube thumbnail of uh, an alt-right influencer named Robin Riley. And she's discussing uh, what revealing for her, she calls her origin story. So in many ways, it's like a rebirth uh, for many of these influencers. Um, and this is quite common across all of the female influencers um, for their YouTube channels. And there on the bottom is a YouTube thumbnail for an influencer named Rebecca Hargraves. She commonly goes by the name Blonde in the Belly of the Beast. And she had already made a, what she called her own red pill video or blog. Um, but there, uh, after soliciting requests on her Twitter account from her followers, they asked if she could make a YouTube video uh, for her male followers on how to red pill women. So while it's important to think about how uh, the role that gender plays in the far right, it may not necessarily be women that tend to recruit women, but as I found in my research, it's overwhelmingly women that tend to recruit men into the far right movement. And that's often on this promise of, uh, of a life that they can have if they join the alt-right or the far right. And next slide, please. So similarly with these influencers, I've also looked uh, in depth at their Instagram accounts. So there on the left is the um, alt-right influencer, uh, Brittany Zellner, who's married to the Austrian leader of Generation Identity, Martin Zellner. And this um, is a screenshot taken from her Instagram account uh, with the two sort of posing like a, a, glam, a glam shot, really. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of uh, comments and likes from her followers on her page. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see the text, so I apologize, but it's things like, you know, you look like Kate Middleton, the, the British princess. Um, you know, people basically praising the couple. Um, as someone from Generation Identities, Luton Branch in the UK says, an example that should be followed for, for other couples in the far right movement. Um, and in this uh, image, I think it very much captures what many people don't recognize when it comes to radicalization in the far right, which is often that it's not always about ideology, which leads people into these movements, but it's often a sense of identity and belonging and community, which Barath had referenced earlier in his talk. And that's um, shown in uh, that Instagram post there on the right from the Canadian influencer Lauren Southern, who's posing there with Brittany Selner. And the text is quite small, but it says, 
It's hard making female friends these days in a world of feminism and cattiness. But Brittany Pettibone, so Brittany Zellner's uh, maiden name is Pettibone, is one of the sweetest, most down-to-earth ladies I've had the pleasure of befriending. And in many ways, these two have talked about how they have developed many female friendships within these spaces um, and how that's a really important role in terms of building relationships and building a sense of collective identity in these spaces. So again, it's not always ideology that can draw followers into this space, but it's about this promise of friendship and of relationships that we need to recognize. And similarly, I wanted to show in contrast to the YouTube content, which is often very political, how Instagram can often be non-political and how one influencer can cultivate a sort of following on various platforms and how it's also important to look at cross-platform posting and how certain platforms can serve different purposes uh, in terms of radicalization and recruitment. Okay, thanks a lot, Evia. Okay, thanks a lot, Evia. Um, so I think this might be a good second to just pause. It looks like we might have had one or two questions um, in the in the chat. Um, uh, maybe from from Adrian Davies, uh, there uh, there might have been a question. I, but I'd like to just take maybe a minute here just to see if uh, anybody has a question. And uh, if not, we can we can keep moving on. And you can always just drop the question in chat also instead of uh, uh, coming in and, and using your video. Hi. Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to ask because there's something that's on my mind a lot and that is what I believe is that a lot of uh, attempts in prevention and countering of radicalization fail to to uh, address or even take into account is that um, we're as individuals as people live in our own reality that is extremely different from that of other people right and um, I can see that a lot with people on the on the far right that, that they really just have a completely different perception of the world. They can read the same piece of news and have a completely different takeaway than, uh, uh, than I would have. And I'm wondering what can be done to actually address that because there's, it's such a fundamental issue. And if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, Benedict, thank you for the for the question. Um, this is actually something we're gonna get into a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but I think it's worth kind of talking about a little bit now. Um, I think we have to be realistic with how much we can ex expect to be able to persuade people. Um, so for, for a lot of people, I think there is a possibility of persuading them and, and telling and challenging them. And there, I think sort of, if someone's coming with a particular idea, presenting them with alternatives, especially in a personal conversation, that could be really kind of, uh, that could be potentially quite, uh, 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 quite useful. But I think if we're talking about like a campaign that's running online, I think one of the things I'm going to talk about later as well is, you know, there's only so much we can do to try to persuade people who, who might have certain kinds of cognitive biases. And everybody has different kinds of cognitive biases. Um, and there, I think it's really about thinking about how do you balance kind of giving them different kinds of messaging, um, but also more how do you intervene in a broader kind of social network um, that, that might actually help them to, to engage with people who, who they trust and that they know that would tell them that actually no, your ideas might be false. Um, but at the end of the day, I really think, um, and this is what most of my research is uh, starting to indicate, the, the best way is actually to, to, to prevent these ideas from spreading in the first place so that those cognitive biases can't be formed. Um, but I'm going to get into that a little bit later uh, in our presentation. Um, we also had a question from uh, uh, from someone that the is it not true that some people blame the problems of the world uh, on white men? Um, I'm not quite sure what the uh, what exactly uh, you mean in, in, in this question, but I think I'll try to to just answer it now. Um, I think it's oh oh please go ahead. Uh, yeah, the thing is that um, 
Oftentimes the problem is that we also interpret these right wingers, oh, they're just a bunch of crazy people with bizarre ideas. But I think part of dealing with this issue is being able to understand where they're coming from. And where they're coming from is that more often than ever, it has become normal to simply say, well, these white men, they're causing all the problems in the world. And this is something that pushes these people further to the right. And of course, uh, there's always people on Twitter that are going to say crazy things. But I'm not just referring to uh, fringe people on Twitter. I was in nature and Naomi Klein, the author of um, The Shock Doctrine, which is a relatively well-known figure and she's an intellectual and she's respected and she has a lot of intelligent things to say. Uh, in the middle of the discussions, she says, well, we all know that white men are the problem. And the whole auditorium claps. And at that point, you have to ask yourself, well, yes, white genocide and all that, it, it, it's uh, imagined. But at some point, can we not acknowledge that there are some objective realities that are pushing people to get radicalized and to consider themselves under threat? Yeah, um, I, maybe I'll give a, a very brief response to that. I, I do agree with you that it's it's really important that when when people are discussing these things, I don't think it's helpful when we say kind of j just place the blame on white men as though we can just kind of say, okay, now we can make a blanket comment about one group of people, but then say we need to be nuanced when we're talking about other groups. I think that's really problematic. Um, so, so I think that that kind of discourse is irresponsible. Um, but I think we also have to remember that a lot of these ideas that the far right uh, and the alt right is using actually come from a long act form of uh, white supremacist activism that has has really been a part of the the democracies that we live in for a long time. Um, so I think you know the the kind of comment like "oh, white men are the problem," which is you know a very cheap way I think of of trying to answer it. Um, is something that can contribute to this process, but I think we have to be more careful to identify the actual ideological sources, and that tends to be sort of associated with uh, with white supremacy uh, and and kind of longer white supremacist movements that have existed uh, for quite some time. Um, Evian, do you want to drop in with a with a comment on that? Uh, I, no, I don't have a comment on, on that question necessarily, but I, I was looking at in the chat bar at Paulina's question, which I'll just take an initial stab at. Um, so Paulina asks, are there any key characteristics that people joining radical movements share? Are there any early signs that could tell a person might be radicalized? I mean, this is a very interesting and a very key question. The short answer is that when it comes to research, there is no definitive answer when it comes to early signs of radicalization. And this is what makes it such a difficult process to understand because it can be tailored based upon each individual. Um, I would say that based on my research of these um, of these female far-right influencers, there are some commonalities that I saw. So in terms of, let's say, socioeconomic backgrounds, all of them are quite well educated. They all went to university. Um, you know, they live in middle-class neighborhoods and, and grew up in middle-class neighborhoods. Um, so I think this kind of goes against this assumption that all people who are radicalized sort of share a, a similar class background or an abusive background, and that's not necessarily true. Um, but something that all these women did share in terms of what I, what I saw from their, their YouTube Red Pill uh, journey vlogs is that they all sort of experienced moments of vulnerabilities and lack of social support networks, which I think we're going to get back to later in this conversation, in the sense that all of them started to feel quite isolated from their friends and their family. They started to, well, frankly, they all started to, to go on social media more often and start looking uh, and watching these um, male YouTubers and, and actually quite extreme content on social media. So they were referencing what are well-known white nationalist and neo-Nazi um, figures. Um, so as soon as these women started to discuss these, these ideas with their friends and their family, they very quickly started to become isolated. And I think um, this is a conversation towards the end, but it's quite important to understand the very important role that social networks can have, at least when it comes then to people starting to voice um, these ideas and these narratives. But thank you for that question, Paulina. Uh, 
Okay, and I'm going to just briefly address uh, Adrian's uh, question about um, uh, about the, the Netflix documentary Social Dilemma. Um, I haven't seen this yet, so uh, so bear with me on my answer. Um, but I think I think yeah, one of the things that we're seeing right is that there's a lot of this kind of idea that there's uh, there's different echo chambers that people live in. Um, and that really defines the kind of ecosystems that they sort of uh, that they that they sort of live in online. Um, but actually, recent research has actually shown that those echo chambers are much more porous than we actually realize. Um, so, in a lot of times, um, there's there's a lot of actually interaction between people who disagree online. And I think what we have to see is it's more about kind of like the ways in which we can challenge motivated reasoning. Uh, so, so kind of the, the motivations people have to um, to become a part of these uh, these kinds of narratives, or the ways in which these narratives might speak to kind of anger or emotions that people feel. Um, and I think one of the issues here, actually, more than uh, this sort of theory about the filter bubbles, it's actually what role do kind of algorithms and social media platform policies play in making kind of extreme ideas more available. Um, so I think that's one of the things that that's really important to to discuss. Okay, well I'm gonna uh, I'm glad that we took some time to to answer some questions. Um, and as always, we'll, uh, we'll put up our email addresses at the end of this if you if you want to continue the conversation with us as we go along. Um, but I think it's time we we move into our our breakout group. So like I said earlier, um, I think it uh, it was better we kind of moved into the presentation and uh, kind of did some questions and answers rather than the first breakout group. Um, but all of you kind of are working on different kinds of radicalization related projects. Um, and at the start, when we uh, when we put this together, we had 20 people in the groups. Um, and Francesco has kindly uh, provided the assignments for each group. So there's five breakout groups available. Um, but we've actually got quite a few more people than when we started. So if your name's not listed, uh, Francesco, if you agree, I would just say, if your name's not listed, just jump into a particular breakout group as you wish. Um, and I'd like to take about uh, 15 minutes for all of you to discuss these four questions. Um, and just keep in mind, four questions, you might not have enough time. If you just get through the first one, that's okay. Um, but I'd like you to go through these four questions. So first, how did you identify people vulnerable to radicalization? Um, what kinds of interventions did you create? How did you measure behavioral change? And what worked and what didn't? And I'd really like you to focus maybe, um, depending on how much time you have, on questions one and three. Um, since you're all going to be going off into different breakout groups, uh, you might not have this slide available. So I'd advise you now to just take a second and do a quick screenshot of it uh, so that you can carry that with you to the breakout groups. Um, and so let's take 15 minutes for you to do that and maybe a couple extra minutes uh, just to get acquainted in your breakout groups. Um, so if we all come back together at, uh, at 4.15, uh, at 4 uh, we'll come back for a, for a broader discussion as a group. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Uh, so we were discussing uh, like how all of us, because we haven't had like much experience directly working with radicalized group, and because as a, like I work in a debating organization, so sometimes we will get like a couple of individuals in a beginner's course that maybe have some extreme views, and we know not to necessarily attack them directly on their first point, or or maybe when they're debating we will say well, this argument isn't very pers persuasive and these are the reasons for it. So people will like start shifting their views and after a while, because they're socializing with the majority of people where the most of us are like, you know, liberal, specifically when it comes to the point of human rights, they tend to like start to moving more like, you know, politically, logically, or even in their behavior towards that side. But I'm not sure how to deal with like larger groups that tend to have extreme views. Uh, so, for example, I was once at this uh, conference that was about feminism and activism, and there were a couple of uh, other female activists that I know, and the group was mostly guys who were in the audience, and really quickly they started attacking us, they didn't even give us a chance to like share our point of view or anything, so if you have like any uh, advice on how to work 
with groups, not when they're coming into you, where you have the majority of people who are liberal and supporting you, but when you're coming to a group where it's most of them together who are uh, radicalized. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to share some thoughts, but maybe Evian, would you like to start with that one? Oh, I was actually, oh, I was actually hoping that you could start first for us and then I'll just add some <laughs> examples. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a really difficult question. I, I liked, uh, I appreciated your reflection about how when you were uh, with a group in, in kind of a, a debate kind of uh, format, you can, the point is that most of the people who are coming there, right, are, are sort of open to having their minds changed. When you're dealing with a bigger group that might be hostile towards your ideas, um, I, it's a very difficult question to answer. So I, I don't really know what the best strategies would be. Um, I think what we have to think about to some degree is prevention. Uh, and we also have to think about to some degree, what is it that uh, uh, you might want to spend some time trying to, if you might know in advance who that audience is, to try to uh, uh, make sense of and, and review some of their arguments that might come up. Um, and then uh, you might want to actually be able to be ready to kind of debunk those arguments from the start. Um, but one of the things is that a lot of this depends on group dynamics and being able to work in and, and disrupt those group dynamics is also really important. Uh, but when you're facing a big group of people who are all kind of disagreeing with you, uh, you're gonna have a very difficult situation. And I think that that's the point where you have to do your best to just hold to your argument and make it as well as you can. And, and this is one of the points that, as we're going to talk about right at the end of the session, the, these are just one of the limits of behavioral change uh, and what kinds of expectations we can have. Um, but I think in a way, working with people one-on-one -on -one is really the best way to do this. Uh, we, had a, we had another question come in. Uh, if I could just offer an opinion on how to handle these situations. I mean, one option is, of course, um, logic, arguments, offering counterpoints that are kind of stronger than theirs, preparing for their arguments, knowing your opponents. But an alternative approach is not considering them opponents to begin with, uh, but fellow people in a conversation. Uh, one thing that will often happen, especially with feminism, is that men will have this preconceived notion of what a feminist is, and they will assume that you have certain views that you don't necessarily hold. My strategy in such situations is to build common ground. Uh, try to explain to them that I'm not this idea of a feminist that they saw on YouTube, that I'm not this stereotype, that I'm actually a person who has a lot more in common with them than they might assume. Of course, there will always be differences, but the idea is not to play into this us versus them narrative, because this us versus them narrative is actually what pushes people into radicalization. Instead, um, showing them that you understand their perspective to some extent, even though you might disagree, uh, showing them that you acknowledge their humanity and you respect their thoughts to some extent, increases the chance that they will listen to be able to at least consider what you have to say. So, I mean, it depends on the group. You can't always do this, but sometimes uh, being friendly rather than adversarial can go a long way. Yes, I, I, I agree with these very excellent points. Um, I don't have much to add except uh, my advice is just to be non-confrontational, to be non-aggressive. And although we're talking about big group dynamics, something that I've noticed in my research with influencers is that they always try to cherry pick evidence, scientific evidence to back up their arguments. And it's very important that you can also uh, recognize and be able to point out why those arguments actually might be failing and, and to encourage critical thinking and critical reasoning when it comes then to presenting evidence and facts in support of your opinion. So those are my two cents on that. Um, I'd like to just uh, um, uh, add to the point that was made before. I don't remember the name of the speaker, unfortunately, but the point about feminism maybe with a personal experience also. Um, I, I consider myself a feminist. Um, uh, 
But when I was in my early 20s, I'm 33 now, when I was in my early 20s and I uh, started studying, um, I was very adamant um, about making clear to people that I'm not a feminist because I had a very, um, very wrong idea of that, what that means. I also, I thought that means women should have, you know, like all the power over men basically to disempower men. Um, and I wasn't even ready to, to listen to, to, to any you know, rational debate on, on that or to engage in that because I was having these really strong preconceptions. And only when my own older sister, um, at some point we watched a movie and I remarked how it was a little bit odd that basically the whole storytelling was all done from a male perspective and that the women were um, really, you know, that they were, weren't really um, taken into account. And she said, oh, so you're a feminist. And that was the first time that I was able also to, to say, okay, maybe, maybe I am, but it was because I was so afraid and I think fear is actually a really big, big thing there. I was so afraid of, uh, of, you know, trying to embrace that, or I was so sure that this, that feminism, this, this word means something so negative that I really needed somebody first that I had a connection with to, um, to, to be able to even have an idea that maybe this is something that, that I would agree with. And only then I also started to read up about it. And I still don't agree with the, with the, uh, some of the stuff that the old feminist movement uh, uh, from the 70s and 80s maybe was, uh, was saying, but I also really, really understand why there's so much frustration in, in a lot of women and especially at, at that time and what that maybe led them to. And this, at the same time, I feel that helps me to understand why, for example, with, uh, when now comes to discussions about Black Lives Matter, for example, when white people say they feel attacked or they don't want to support that because they they feel disenfranchised. Um, I'm a white person. I really have no problem with saying I support Black Lives Matter. Even if somebody tells me all white people are, are racist, I'd rather look and I, I, I'm trying to understand what is the feeling that this person is coming from and what are the experiences that makes them say that rather than saying, okay, now I feel attacked. And that's why I'm going to counter your point, not even take that into consideration. Yeah, thank you, Benedict. I, th I think that's a really important point about, uh, about behavioral change. Um, I want to get to those points. We're running a little bit short on time, but maybe uh, I know there was one bigger contribution, or sorry, one bigger breakout group. Um, did you have any interesting answers to one of these questions? Uh, maybe just one person from that group if they wanted to chime in. Okay, if not, uh, I hope you had a good conversation. Um, uh, just to just to remind all of you, you know, Evian and I are also more than happy to to t continue this conversation over email or or elsewhere. So so just get in touch if you'd like to to do that. But um, in the last few minutes of our presentation, um, I'd like to talk through a little bit more about uh, about behavioral change. Um, and I think one of the things that's important is that we think about what are the opportunities and what are the limits when it comes to thinking about behavioral change. Um, a lot of times, especially when it comes to countering violent extremism campaigns, especially the ones that are focused online, really tend to center around marketing metrics. And I just really want to stress that while this can be useful for some purposes, marketing metrics are not the same thing as behavioral change. And so a lot of times you're going to be developing campaigns that are using social media platforms and they provide you all kinds of different metrics uh, uh, when you when you put put an ad up or, or put uh, some sponsored content uh, up on a platform. It's important to remember that these advertising metrics are designed for marketing. They're not designed for countering radicalization and they tend to be focused on impressions, clicks and click through rate and the time viewed. Often that doesn't tell us too much about actually what people are doing or what kinds of interactions they have. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, uh, uh, about how we can get into that data to figure out, okay, well, actually, how do we measure and think about behavioral change? Um, 
A lot of these marketing metrics also, when you're doing these advertisements, they rely on key term or interest-based micro-targeting. Um, and a lot of the effectiveness of that kind of advertising is often overstated. Um, so it's important to remember there's limits to, to that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, marketing strategy. As well, it doesn't tell us too much about how people interact or what kind of behavioral change has actually occurred. So I, wanna, I want all of you, when you're developing any kind of uh, uh, programs like this, to really be critical about uh, to what extent these kind of marketing metrics can actually help us. But I do think that there's kind of three ways that you can really engage in behavioral change. And I think we've heard a little bit about that uh, today, um, especially uh, uh, from Benedict's point, uh, uh, as well as uh, an earlier question. Um, and so when you're running an online campaign, uh, one of the things you might want to do is think about how am I going to incorporate feedback into my process, right? Uh, you might not be able to put out surveys, which is kind of a gold standard for, for trying to do this, but you might want to use different kinds of polling tools or analyzing the comments that people might leave. So if you might make a video that's trying to get people to, to, to discuss something related to radicalization, you might want to encourage people to leave comments and then spend some time analyzing those comments. Uh, this is going to be different for what each platform will let you do, and I think it's a good idea to ask those questions from different people who have more experience with doing these campaigns uh, at, at other uh, uh, sessions in the camp this week. As well, another thing you might want to do is engage in different kinds of observation, and this can really help. So just observing what people say. So, so you might have had a video that targets particular kinds of people or particular social media accounts, and you might want to see what kinds of changes have happened over time. Uh, you might also want to see what kinds of comments might they leave under a video on YouTube uh, or uh, something that you might have shared on Facebook. Those might be some ways to get a sense of behavioral change, right? It's not going to be a big scale, right? You're not going to have lots and lots of numbers to share like you might with, uh, with those advertising numbers, but it will give you a chance to sort of at least get a more granular level and get some ideas about what people are thinking. And so observation is another kind of key way of trying to think about behavioral change. And then the last point that I want to stress here, and I think this is the most important thing, is of all of the methods we've seen in terms of trying to challenge uh, radicalization and countering radicalization, one-to-one -one discussions are by far the most valuable and the most useful. And I think that's one of the things that we've heard, right? By being able to talk to someone that you trust, uh, you might be able to be persuaded a little bit more than just something that you see online. One of the cool things is that different messaging services, so Facebook Messenger, but also Discord, Telegram, etc., cetera, uh, have some features that might allow you to engage with people individually. And it's those one-to-one -one conversations where you can make a difference. Right? But again, that's really time intensive, it's really labor intensive, and it's not as easy as what these marketing metrics can give you. So one of the things you have to think about is what are you going to prioritize? And I really think that building feedback into your campaigns and having observational methods is going to be really useful for trying to measure and understand behavioral change. And then also using one-to-one -one discussions is really going to be one of the most promising ways forward. Um, at the end of the session uh, and moving forward, we'll give you some resources, some open access resources you can use to develop some of these ideas. Um, and one of those things is a guide on how to develop one-to-one -one, uh, conversations uh, from the Institute of Strategic Dialogue. Um, I just want to say kind of one of the things you want to do is really focus on what levels am I trying to, to focus on. And in countering violent ex extremism, there's kind of three levels that people talk about. So the first one is primary, which is really thinking about the general public, where you're thinking about how do I counter hate? How do I challenge the spread of extremist narratives? How do I engage in media literacy? And then secondary is when you've identified those who are vulnerable to extremism and focusing a little bit more on people that are radicalized. And I think based on what we've heard from the audience today, these are the levels that you're going to be working on the most. So I'm just going to put together uh, just kind of two key points um, about working at these primary and secondary levels that I think are really important. So especially when it uh, comes to the online sphere. The research tells us that maintaining taboos and ostracizing extremist views is really important. That doesn't mean attacking people, but to say that extremist views uh, kind of cross a certain line and to stand together against those is something that's really important. Uh, 
It's important to remember that our politicians and media are making this more and more difficult. Um, and you know, there's a lot of evidence, and I've linked to some of that in the resources that we'll share at the end of the presentation. Um, counter narratives are not so promising when they're uh, developed uh, by in, uh, by formal actors, but when informal actors do deliver those counter narratives, so people that you trust, right, or people that you know aren't necessarily like a government program or something like that, then it's a lot more effective. And I think one of the key things also with behavioral change is you really need to think about personal networks rather than just content and individuals. So in a way, maybe thinking about behavioral change is working with friends, family, and others that are connected to a vulnerable person rather than trying to change their opinions. So really it's about finding a vulnerable person and then looking at their personal network and trying to create and structure interventions in that way. And that's gonna be a lot more effective, I think, in, in delivering behavioral change. Um, there's still 20, uh, 20 or so, uh, 20 or so people. Um, and, uh, yes, Adrian, I will watch the, uh, I will watch the film. Uh, that's a fair bit of a uh, homework assignment. Um, but I think, uh, uh, it would be a good moment now just to, to give Evie on the floor for a few minutes if she wants to add anything into the conversation before we break. Uh, just in, for the sake of time, I don't have much to add, but I would just say that on this first point about uh, we need to maintain taboos and ostracization of extremist views is that, I mean, there's often this notion that we need to understand the grievances of people who are drawn into extremist networks and, and movements. And while that's absolutely true, we should understand those grievances. We also do have a duty to not legitimize those into far right or extreme right uh, views and so forth. So it's an important distinction to make there. So we should understand and explain, but not necessarily legitimize those who are drawn to extremist views. Um, yes, and I suppose just, just to reiterate absolutely this point about personal networks is super important. As I mentioned with these uh, female influencers, it, this, the, the loss of a support network, um, the, the feelings of alienation and social isolation were really the catalyst for them uh, in terms of being drawn into to radicalization and so forth. So I cannot un overestimate uh, how important that is in terms of building those personal networks at play. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, we see more and more people online at this point. We don't see so much sort of face-to-face -face interactions. So we need to be especially cautious during this time. Okay, and uh, I know we're a little bit over time, um, but if anyone has a quick burning question, please pop it into the chat. I'm just going to address Benedict's question very quickly. Um, he asks, if there's time, uh, could you also tell us a bit about the connection between behavioral change and attitudinal change? That's a really good question. I've sort of conflated the two in this presentation just for the ease of kind of not making this too academic. Um, but one of the key points here is that when we're thinking about how do we change behaviors, right? I think we have to understand behavior as something that happens from a social ecology, right? So that's what I mean by a personal network. It's a set of factors that are also outside of the individual. Um, attitudinal change is more about what's happening internal within the, uh, within the individual, right? Um, and in both senses, media is, is really important. Uh, but also I think for changing attitudes, it's also important to think about who is uh, who's surrounding a particular individual uh, and how might we work with the people that that person is connected to in order to affect those attitudes. Um, so I, I think one of the key points I want all of you to take away is that there's only so much we can do by using counter content or counter messaging in order to change people's minds, to change people's behaviors and their attitudes. Um, but if we do that alongside working with the right kinds of actors and the right kinds of people like informal actors, uh, that can be a much more effective way to, uh, to, to move forward. Um, and so, so that's kind of one of the things that I'd like to, uh, to keep you in, uh, to, for you to keep in mind. Uh, Benedict, I hope that, that kind of helps to answer your, your question. Do you have some experience with conversations based on logic, which is so important for young men? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of have some of this experience just because um, I, for, through the process of teaching at, uh, at a university, um, uh, especially some teaching on, at technical university, I don't have as much experience with that. Um, I, I really think one of the key things, as we said earlier, is not to attack people for their views, but to attack their views themselves, and also to have like uh, some kind of 
ready-made kind of approaches to countering certain kinds of ideas, right? We didn't talk about that too much today because that wasn't the topic. But for example, if there might be young men who, for example, are really anti-feminist, one of the ways in which I've tried to approach that in my classes where we've dealt with gender, for example, is really to get them to think about, well, what evidence do you have for the claims that you're making? And I think that that works especially well for people who are scientifically minded, um, because actually asking them to sort of uh, sort of say, okay, well, what kind of evidence do you have when they uh, when someone makes a claim that might not be true? Uh, and and what I've found is that a lot of times there's kind of these sort of mental backflips that are happening where they're very scientific, they believe in the scientific method, but then when it comes to something where they have kind of a bias about, they start using anecdotes, right? So it's important to have kind of like uh, some evidence to say, actually, no, you know. Uh, you know, maybe these kinds of facts about gender are actually true, um, and you can go and look it up, and then ask them to go and look it up and to do a little bit of research there. I think getting them to interact with these ideas a little bit might be might be kind of useful, um, but it's not something I have a huge amount of experience with. Um, but I do I do really think uh, uh, that's one way to to go about it. Okay, well. I want to I want to wrap up here and uh, like I've said over and over again, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, our email addresses are available, and you can find both of us on Twitter. Um, but I'd like all of you, kind of going forward, to consider answering these two questions for yourselves, um, or maybe just write them down and keep them there for for a, a later day if you're working on a campaign. Um, but it would be interesting for you to answer. How would you integrate more complex measurements of behavioral change into your interventions and campaigns? And that's going back to that idea about feedback, observations, and one-to-one -one approaches. And then second, based on what you've thought about today, how would you revise your own plans for future projects? So I know all of you have been thinking about this stuff. You might not have had time yet to put your own kinds of plans together. But it would be good for you to reflect upon you know, some of the things that you've heard, maybe some of the points that we've raised that you agree with or disagree with, and what that might teach you uh, about your own plans for future projects. So if you want, you know, uh, screenshot the slide, but these things will all be shared uh, uh, in the future. Um, and then finally, I just want to say thank you for, for participating. Um, and then these are the some contact details if you'd like to get in touch with us. Um, we're more than happy to, uh, to speak with all of you. Um, and I think, uh, Evian, if you'd just like to say the last couple of words, uh, and then we can wrap up the session. Yes, not much. Just thank you so much. And sorry for, for going over time, but it seems like we've really stimulated quite an interesting discussion. So thank you for participating.